like many of you, life can seem sometimes pretty vicious. As a church over the last about five weeks, we've had two major tragedies within our family here at Crossroads. And those are just the major ones. There's been a number of situations that have been equally hard for people. But on uh, Christmas Eve, we lost Chris Beacock, who'd grown up here at Crossroads, tragically, leaving behind loved ones and friends and family, having made an enormous impact on a lot of people. And just this week, on the 3rd of February, it, was, it made the national news, there was a workplace shooting here in Vancouver, actually the first of what ended up becoming two workplace shootings, because there was another one the following day. But um, Ryan Momley, who him and his wife Michelle have been coming to Crossroads for the last number of months, and Ryan lost his life in that workplace shooting before the, the person took his own life. We have people in our congregation who were in the second shooting at the uh, Veterans Affairs. We have people in our fellowship who work there. Who are... And so, like you, we struggle at times to try and understand these things. And I'll be honest, like I'm, a, I'm a pastor here, one of many. Um, I've been around the block a, a few times. But when tragedy happens, I'm learning how to process it all. I hope that's okay. You know, I think the day and age of the pastor who has all the answers and can give you all the right, I, like, we all knew that that wasn't really real. So I'm learning how to walk with the Lord in the midst of tragedy. I'm learning how to show up at situations that are hard. And what do you say? What don't you say? I remember when my mother was diagnosed with cancer when I was 20 years old. The first time I ever saw my father cry was that day. Never saw him cry before. The guy had never cried, not one time. And on that one day, on that one day, I saw him cry for the first time. And what I've learned over the years and what we are learning as a community right now is not only how do you live with tragedy, tragedy, but how do you have a life that blossoms and is fruitful when the circumstances of life leaves us wounded, broken, hurt? How do we do that? And we live in a culture that does not have the emotional nor theological wherewithal to be able to answer the big questions and so people grasp, and we all grasp together. How do we live with wounds and pain? How do we live with tragedy and not just endure life, but thrive through life? I remember when my mother ended up passing away, I had someone say to me, don't let anyone ever tell you that time heals all wounds. That's a total lie. I said, time only makes those wounds feel normal. And that's true. That's true. When tragedies hit, those wounds never heal. They just become normal. You get used to having scar tissue. But here's the thing. Tragedies happen, but Jesus is real. And I want to talk to us this evening. We're, we're taking a break from Leviticus to look at tragedy and to look at what we need to do in the midst of tragedy. Because for me, the Bible is actually full of tragedies. If you read through the Bible in a year, you're going to see almost on every page a tragedy that happens. Think when Adam and Eve ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in Genesis chapter 3. That was a tragedy. They disobeyed God and they became instantly separated from themselves, God, and each other. I mean, think about Genesis 4. You have Cain killing Abel. 
The very first family had brother killing brother. You think about Joseph, his brothers sold him into slavery, told his dad he was dead. There was the famine in Egypt or the famine in Israel that sent the children of Israel to Egypt. I mean, can you imagine that kind of a tragedy where nobody has any food? Some of you grew up in places that were like that. It's a tragedy. We saw in Leviticus chapter 10, the death of Nadab and Abihu as they offered profane fire before the Lord and they died on what should have been a festive day. Of course, you move into the New Testament and you have tragedies like the crucifixion of Jesus. I mean, imagine that. It's a man who walked around and did good, healed the sick, spoke the words of God, took care of people, mocked and beaten, killed. You have the tragedy of when Stephen was martyred in the book of Acts, the Apostle Paul's imprisonment. And that's just like me cherry picking just a few. The Bible is full of tragedies. But the Bible also teaches us how to deal with tragedy as well. If you're with us on Sundays, we're going through the book of Ecclesiastes and we talk about what goes on under the sun. Tragedies go on under the sun. They happen. Life happens. So what we're going to do tonight in, it's kind of different than what we normally do is I'm just going to, I'm going to take the word tragedy, T-R-A-G-E-D-Y. And I'm going to give you one thing we need to do from each letter. This is, a, this is one of those messages that it's, and there'll be a lot of scripture in here. So don't think that I'm not going to quote a lot of Bible. But I want to give you tools. Because for some of you, the tragedies of this last month are right there for you. And I, my hope is that it will help. For, for others of you, you've had tragedies in your past and you're still working through it and I'm hoping that this will help you. For some of you, you've been blessed with your life has been tragedy-less. But at some point, something's going to go down that's going to be unwelcomed and hurtful. And as we always say, you don't run a race without first training for the race. And so my hope is, is that by going through these points... It will give you something to think about and pray about and fortify your hearts with. So I'm going to take each letter of the word tragedy. So for T, we need to trust. We need to trust God. Now I want to explain that because I realize that in the midst of, of a personal tragedy, that sounds almost like a, like a plaque. Like, I mean, like seriously? And the answer is yes, Seriously. This is what I want to tell you. There is a difference between trust and belief. There's a big difference. You can believe something and not trust something. There was an, there's an author named Frank Peretti who I once saw a video of his called The Chair. And in this video, he had a chair on the stage and he was explaining the difference between belief and trust. Now you can imagine if there was a chair sitting here, I could say, I believe that that chair is going to hold my weight. That I'm going to sit on it and that chair is going to hold me up. And I might believe it. But you only put legs on that belief when you actually sit down in the chair. It's one thing to say, I believe it will hold me up. And it's quite another thing to get in the chair. The difference between belief and trust is trusting is actually sitting on the chair and finding out by experience that it will hold your weight. When tragedy happens, we need to trust the Lord. Not just I believe in God, but literally trust that He can bear the weight of what we're experiencing. In order to trust God, we need to have the faith to commit ourselves into His hands. One of the most classic, famous, most 
oft quoted and memorized scripture is Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. The reason why it's so often quoted and memorized is because deep down in our souls, we know that verse has everything we really need in it. But we draw on those things in the midst of tragedy. So when tragedy enters your life, we need to trust in the Lord with all of our hearts. And and think about what that means. It means the totality. If you think about what your heart is, your heart is the control center of your life. The, The information from your thoughts and from your body and from your emotions come into the heart, the center of who you are, and the heart makes decisions. And when it says trust in the Lord with all your heart, it's saying completely and thoroughly thrust yourself into the chair of who the Lord is, knowing that he can handle your tragedy. And it says, lean not on your own understanding. So not sit in there with your hands on the floor and your feet on the floor, holding yourself up, pretending like you're sitting, but literally take your hands and feet off and trust that that chair has everything that you need. In tragedy, we need to trust. Why? Because in our ways, when we acknowledge him, he will lead us. See, the problem with the way our culture deals with tragedy is oftentimes it gives you a set of steps to take that leave you worse off after. I mean, even look at the way our government makes decisions, the proportioned response. That's just, that's revenge killing with a little mercy mixed in, maybe. Now, I get that there's political ramifications, but that's the way we learn how to deal with things. Someone hurts you, hurt them worse. Or don't hurt them as bad because you're a nice person. But the Bible teaches something completely different. And if we completely place our lives and our hearts in trusting the Lord, completely not trusting in what we believe or could do. When we acknowledge him in our ways, he'll say, take that step. So we need to learn how to trust the Lord. So that's the T. After, in tragedy, T-R. We need to repent. Wow, you're like, great. We need to repent. Let me explain this to you. Repentance is a, is a, it's a biblical word. It's a church word. If you actually read the Gospels, it's the first word of the Gospel. The first words out of Jesus' mouth in public ministry is, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Now, when I hear the word repent, especially as I was coming to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, I heard that word, and I always think of some guy with too much facial hair standing on a milk carton frothing at the mouth, yelling at everybody. Repent! Repent! You're going to hell! And so that's, for a lot of people, when you hear that word repent, that's what you think. You think of some guy who needs to probably take a pill and and get a little, like, sensitivity training, frothing at the mouth. But repentance is a word that literally means to bring back together. It's a word of relationship. It means you're running from a relationship. Come back. You've strayed. Come home. It's not an angry word. It's a word of love. It's saying, come back. And the reason we need to repent, you and I, is because when you are confronted with tragedy, whether it's somebody shooting somebody else, You think, man, murder. But then you think of what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, that if you hate your brother without a cause, you've murdered him in your heart. So we can't imagine maybe taking a firearm and going somewhere and actually shooting somebody, but we all understand what it's like to hate somebody. And Jesus explains that at the root of our actions is the disposition of our hearts. And so every 
absurd thing that could happen to somebody, every tragedy that could be perpetrated, we have solidarity with that same disposition of rebellion in our hearts. We might never do it. We might never do those things, but we understand the root causes of it because what is in any person is in all of us. So it's easy in the midst of tragedy to figure out who am I going to blame? How am I going to show them that they're wrong? When really what we need to do is instead of lashing out, we need to look within by the Holy Spirit and say, God, I have the same roots in my heart. So God, change me. Doesn't that change a tragedy? When you start saying, I'm not going to lash out, but I'm going to look within my own heart. And know what I'm going to find? I have the same stuff in me. I have the same bitterness and hatred, the same whatever in my heart. See, when we view tragedies, it gives us an opportunity to take stock of who we are. I mean, I, I was thinking about Ryan Momley, who lost his life on Monday around lunchtime. Him and his wife came to church on Sunday. They left church and they were, heard the message about how community is essential and they were talking about coming a second Saturday to try and start engaging and meeting more people. You know, never even knowing never even knowing that that was going to be his last 24 hours. Greg Young, our director of building services, spoke to me and he was at the first service and he said, you know, Pastor Daniel, I was really struck because you, at the end of your message, you talked about if today is your last day, are you going to let it be a day of love or what? And I didn't even remember saying that until he reminded me of it. And he said, when you said that, He's like, I just got the sense that that was a very real reality for someone. When tragedy happens, you remember that life is short. And you can't put off for tomorrow fixing what you can fix today. I remember I asked my father after my mother passed away, I said, Dad, do you have any regrets? And he said, you know, I do. I, I do have a regret. So what was that? He said, you know, I didn't tell your mom I loved her as much as I did. And he's like, and now I'll never get the chance. And as God has brought my father another helpmate, it's amazing how different he is with her. Because he learned that you can't undo what's already been done. So we need to repent. When we're confronted with tragedy, we need to look at our hearts and say, if this is my last day, how do I want it to go? What do I want to say? Do I really want to fight about that? Do I really want to let that be the last thing that I'm known for? Do I really want that thought to be the last thing I say to the world on Facebook? Is that really who I want to portray to the world? That's me? Man. And when you start, you know what happens when you start thinking that way? You start changing, don't you? Because you start saying, I don't want to be that person. And if that's my last thing, that's would be the worst representation of where I'm really at. And you say, well, if that's the worst representation of where I'm really at, then why am I that way today? And that's why not only do we need to trust God, but we need to repent. We need to come back and return to the relationship that God has for us in Christ. And we say, God, purify my life. I want to respond to you, God. I want to draw close to you. God, I don't want that to be the testimony of who I am. Yeah, Lord, I'm growing. But God, I want this life, if this is my last day, to be beautiful, to be loving and kind and grace-filled and joyful. So we need to repent. T-R-A. We need to accept our new situation. I think one of the hardest things we have as humans is to accept circumstances that we didn't choose to say this is what is now but we need to accept I think of Job when you think of tragedy 
you remember the book of Job, Job was a, had a great life. Everything about his life was amazing. He had an amazing family. He had resources. There was a lot of love. And in a quick series of events, Job lost everything. He lost his homes, his resources. He lost his kids. And listen to what it says in Job chapter 2, verses 7 and 10. It says, So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took for himself a potsherd with which to scrape himself while he sat in the midst of ashes. Now think about it. So Job has lost everything and now he loses his health. Like he's got boils where he has a piece of clay that he's scraping the sores on his body while he sits in ashes. So Job was a complete riches to rags story very quickly. And to make matters worse, in verse 9 it says, Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. That's a horrible thing to say, right? She, say, she says to him like, like are, are you still going to be an integrity man? Look at you. Just curse God and die. How many of us are Job's wife sometimes? Like, just pour just meanness into people's pain. Like, there's so many things she could have said to bring encouragement, and she doesn't come up with any of them. She's like, just tell God off and die. We got to be careful, don't we? It's so easy to be like, oh, Job's wife. I mean, and, and I can make a lot of good Job's wife jokes. But it's like how often when somebody needs a shoulder to cry on, a friend, we show up with just some terrible things to be said. But listen to what Job says. In verse 10, he says, You speak as one of the foolish women speak. Shall we indeed accept good from God? And shall we not accept adversity? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. See, Job didn't understand what was going on, but he trusted God. And he said, if God can bless me, shall I not accept adversity as well? Like, have we ever been promised a life that is going to be free from any sort of hardship? Has anybody ever had that promise to them? I mean, Jesus said in, John 16, that in the world you will have what? Tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have what? Overcome the world. See, Jesus says, listen, life's going to be hard, but I'm going to be with you. I'm going to walk with you. My presence is going to be with you in the midst of struggle and trial. So one of the things that we need to do in the midst of tragedy is we need to learn how to accept the season of life we're in. We saw that, didn't we, in the beginning of Ecclesiastes chapter 3, that under heaven, there is seasons for everything. There's a time to mourn and there's a time to dance. There's a time to embrace and there's a time to stop embracing. That under heaven, all sorts of things are going to happen. And we have to learn how to accept that reality. And that's why Jesus would say in Matthew 16, 24, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. See, Jesus is saying, if you want to be my disciple, if you want to learn from me, you have to accept that you are not God. You have to deny your view of how your life is going to go. You have to take up your cross, which means you have to be continually in the process of dying so that we can follow him. That is... Discipleship 101. Saying, God, not my will, but yours be done. God, I don't have control over certain things. So I'm going to deny my desire to control everything. And I'm going to trust you as I follow you. Accepting the reality of tragedy is not easy, is it? How many of us 
deal with tragedy by pretending it didn't happen, finding ways to look past it. One of the things that I've found in my own life is that God, the only way is to go through it. There's no way around it. I mean, we've all tried in tragedy, haven't we? We've, we've tried to find ways to not accept it. A lot of us use all sorts of numbing tactics, whether they be drugs or alcohol, prescription medication, sexuality and sin of all sorts, excessive entertainment, excessive shopping. The things we do to try and get around what we can only go through. Part of it is this accepting that, hey, this is going to be a rough road. I've lost a loved one. I've lost things. But God, you've given me good things in life. Shall I not expect adversity as well? So not only do we need to trust and not only do we need to repent, but we need to accept what it is. T-R-A. And then, of course, G. We need to grieve. I, wanna, I want to give you all permission to grieve in tragedy. And the reason I want to give you that permission is I feel that as a Christian, the church sometimes is the worst place to grieve because well-meaning people make you feel bad because you're grieving. But so easy to forget the shortest verse in your Bible, John chapter 11, verse 25. Jesus wept. Where did Jesus weep? At the tomb of Lazarus. Now, now think about this. I mean, Jesus knew Lazarus was sick and he didn't go. And he told his disciples, we're not going yet. And then when it's time to go, he said, look, Lazarus is dead. But I go to wake him up. Think about this. And because and, and like, he says, Lazarus sleeps, but I go to wake him up. And they're like, oh, you know, if he's sleeping, it'll get better. And he's like, no, no, he's dead. But I'm going to go resurrect him from the dead. So Jesus goes there late, knowing that Lazarus is dead and had been in the tomb and he's going to go resurrect him bodily from the dead. And when he gets to the tomb, he talks to Mary, he talks to Martha, everybody's crying and what does Jesus do? He weeps. You need to grieve. You need to. Let me explain to you why you need to grieve. Because you love. And when love is lost, grief is the only proper human response. God, I said it a million times. I'll say it a million more times. God did not send Jesus to make us inhuman or superhuman. He came to make us truly human. And part of being truly human is loving somebody enough to grieve when they are no longer there. We grieve because we love. God never created us for death. God created us to live forever. Death was never part of God's original intention for humanity. So every time, every single time we are confronted with it, it is abnormal for us. But here's the thing about grief. I'm going to quote the Apostle Paul, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 and 14. He says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, those who have died, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Now you notice what he says, I don't want you to be ignorant. I don't want you to sorrow as those who have no hope. Now this is the thing. There is a way to grieve that has no hope. And then there, there is a way to grieve that is hope-laden. 
And for the people of God, for those who trust in Jesus, we learn how to grieve as one who has hope that this life is not all that there is. That this time, whether it's 20 years or 10 years or three months or 100 years, this is not all that life is. That we were created and will live eternally. It's just a matter of where and why. And so in our grieving for people who we have lost, we don't grieve as those who have no hope. For Chris and Ryan, we're going to see them again in glory. And we're going to miss them until we see them again. But we're going to see them again. And they're going to look great. And we're going to look great. But this life is not all that there is. And in our grief, we realize that there is a separation and separation hurts and we wouldn't have chosen it, but this is not all that there is. We believe in a resurrection from the dead. We believe in an eternal life in Christ for those who believe. And we know that there is going to come a day when everyone's going to be back together again. But we just have to learn how to break camp until that day comes. We have to learn how. So we need to grieve, but not as those who have no hope. So, T-R-A-G and then E. We need to embrace. By saying we need to embrace, we need to embrace life as it is presently, not what it used to be. We need to embrace our experiences, this side of tragedy, as the new normal. Remember before I said we need to accept it? There's a difference between accepting it and embracing it. Isn't there? Acceptance is, I am going to endure this. Embracing it is, I am going to flourish in this. And that's a huge difference. Now I'm here to tell you, for those of you who have lost loved ones, you do not honor the people you love by white-knuckling the rest of your life. You don't. They are not looking down from heaven saying, you should not have fun because I'm not there. They don't do that. They want you to blossom in the midst of tragedy. They want that. I'll never forget. It was like, my mother passed away and I spent three hours laying in bed. I did. I would just pull the covers over my head I'm like, forget this. If this, is, if this is what life is, I don't want any. And after about three hours, I could hear my mom in my ear saying, what are you doing? What are you doing? And my mom was all Italian, strong lady. You know, even if you didn't know my mom, she was going to tell you what she thought about everything. It's kind of scary, you know. Everyone I met was like, man, your mom, she's tough. Man, what's it like being raised by her? I'm like, eh. I could hear, like, it was like, she died and she's in my ear. Like, what are you doing? And I remember being like, oh, yeah, I'm copping out. I'm pretending that some ways this is an acceptable way to respond I was looking to just endure it. But I believe God wants us to embrace life the way it is. I believe that when God rototills our life through, our, through tragedy, he wants to plant a more beautiful garden that was there before. I, I once read a devotional that spoke about a person who would sit on a fence and overlook this beautiful field that was in a streams in the desert by Mrs. Charles Cowan classic devotion beautiful and this person used to sit and they would look at this beautiful field and it was green and lush and every day they'd go out there and they would just love this field and then all of a sudden one day they went out there and someone had rototilled the whole thing and they went out there and they thought what'd they do to my beautiful field this is horrible I was mad about the rototilling 
only to realize later after it was planted and started to blossom that they rototilled something beautiful to make it more beautiful. In a lot of ways, tragedy is the rototiller. It takes something beautiful, something green and lush and makes it brown and ugly. But not just so it's brown and ugly forever, so that it can be replanted and flourish more beautifully. And if you read your Bibles, when you watch the way tragedy works in the Bible, that's what happens. Is that God takes tragedy and he makes something beautiful, more beautiful out of it. You think of the children of Israel. They built a beautiful temple. It was amazing. It was majestic. And then it got burned to the ground because they rebelled against God. And then when they went back to rebuild the temple, the people who had seen the, the old temple thought this temple stinks. Our other temple was much nicer, much bigger. But the Lord said the glory of the latter temple will be greater than the former temple. Why? Because that was the temple that the Son of God was going to walk into. God's design is that the latter glory be greater than the former. But we need to embrace life as it is. We need to say, okay, I'm going to go forward with a limp like Jacob. I've learned that God likes his kids with a limp. Because we trust in him. Because that limp means that God met us somewhere. That's what that limp means. Think of the Apostle Paul. Listen to what he says. Philippians chapter 3. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things that are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. When the Apostle Paul says, I forget those things which are behind, he's not saying, I don't remember it anymore. He's saying, I embrace what they've been so that I can keep moving forward. Some of us in the midst of tragedy can never forget it, and so we perpetually live there. And that's not embracing it. That's getting stuck. God wants you to incorporate and integrate everything you learn through tragedy. But he wants you to push forward. Embrace the next step. So we have T-R-A-G-E next. D. We need to defeat. We need to defeat our fears. And we need to defeat the darkness that tragedy is and brings. There's a battle, I believe. And if you've experienced tragedy in your life, you realize that what, one of the ways in our fallenness that we deal with tragedy is we want to, we get dark from it. We get bitter. We get angry. We find ourselves lashing out. One of the most normal responses to tragedy is to get apathetic about life. To say, man, I'm just gonna, like, what can I do? It's like, I'll try, it's gonna stink anyway. That's a very common response. And I believe that by the power of the Holy Spirit, God wants us to defeat those urges. To sink down into it and instead rise above it. Perseverance is a big word in the Bible, isn't it? Comes up over and over and over again. What you find in the Bible of people who persevere is none of them seem to be inherently strong on their own. But God shows up in their lives and empowers them to be abnormal to who they have normally been. I mean, Gideon, God calls him while he's hiding out in a cave. And God sends Gideon into battle with only 300 people to defeat a huge army. I mean, this was the guy hiding out in the cave. When God called him, he's like, no, Lord, not me. Like, I'm the least of the least of the least. I'm hiding out in a cave. Don't you remember where you found me? It's a battle that God's kids learn how to fight 
in the spirit, not with carnal weapons, but with weapons that are mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. This reminds me of Exodus chapter 14. When Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. Brothers and sisters, in the midst of our tragedies, we need to defeat our fears. We need to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. You might be saying, well, you know, okay, so Fusco, how, how's that possible? I believe it's possible simply just by asking. Even in the quietness of your own heart right now, saying, saying, God, I'm not sure about all this, but I need, I need to see your salvation. David said it in the Psalms, I would have lost heart if I did not believe I would see the hand of the Lord in the land of the living. He's saying, with all the tragedy that I've seen, if I did not believe I would see God move, I would have lost heart in this life. And the same is true for you and I. We need to say, Lord, please help me to rise above the pain. Help me to rise above the fears. Help me to rise above the darkness. I want to see your salvation, your redemption. I want to see your deliverance in my darkness. Help me to hold my peace and stand still and look up as my redemption draws near. In some ways, that's not the mark of the strong person. That's the mark of the person who knows that they're too weak to get through it on their own. Do you ever think about that? People all the time, if, you know, I'm from New Jersey, so people are very straightforward. My friends would be like, man, I don't understand why you'd believe in Jesus. It's a total crutch. I'm like, yeah, it is. Because I'm broken. I'm like, crutches are appropriate if you got broken legs. I mean, he's more than a crutch. He's a wheelchair. He's like a medevac. Like I'm mangled and Jesus is bringing me to healing. And I'm like, I have no... Can, I have no problem saying that I'm broken and I can't do this on my own and I don't want to do this on my own and I wasn't even created to do this on my own and in order to make it through a life that is riddled with trials I need the help of the almighty God I need him and there's no problem with saying I need that because what you find is the people who say I don't need that you see the fruit of what it looks like because we've all done it right I'm going to do it on my own and you get there and you're white knuckled, you're bitter, you're angry, you're mad. And everybody around you feels it and you feel it, but you're like, I'm doing it on my own. When God's like, no, no, let me do it in you and through you. Let me do it. But we need to defeat that fear. And I believe God has already done it for us in Christ. So T R A G. E D and our final one for this evening, why? We need to yearn. We need to yearn. Remember I said before that we grieve, but not as those who have no hope. Part of being a human being in light of the finished work of Jesus is to remember that we are citizens of multiple worlds. Our citizenship is here and it's in heaven. And we yearn to come to our final resting place. There's a part of who you are that can't wait to be home. There's a part of who you are that those who we have lost, we realize are better off than we are because they finished their race. The Apostle Paul says it quite succinctly in Philippians chapter 1. He says, for me to live is Christ and to die is what? Gain. That's a crazy statement. He says, for me to live, I get Jesus, but to die is gain. He's saying it's good now and it's even better later. And we have to remember, I realize that death is scary because we've never experienced it. 
But death is the door that opens into eternity. C.S. Lewis said it this way. He said, I find in myself a desire which no experience in the world can satisfy. The most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. If none of my earthly pleasures satisfy me, that does not prove that the universe is a fraud. Probably earthly pleasures were never really meant to satisfy, but only to arouse it, to suggest the real thing. I must keep alive in myself the desire for my true country, which I shall not find till after death. I must make it the main object of life to press on to that other country and to help others to do the same. Now I'm going to invite the worship team out as we close out the message. And I do not believe we should be escapists from this world. And here's why. And I think Christianity of maybe the last 50 years is kind of like a, let's just get me out of here. You know, Jesus, come back and get me out of here. I believe that betrays the life that God has given us. Because if God has numbered our days and numbered the hairs on our head, we shouldn't be trying to get out of here early. Say, Lord, while you have me here, there's fruit for my labor. For me to live is Christ on this side of heaven. So I don't think we should be escapists, but we also shouldn't throw out the baby with the bathwater either. We shouldn't try and get out of here. We're here as many days as God gives us. But we realize that this, we're only passing through. We are pilgrims, sojourners, This is not our truest life. This is just a chapter in a much greater story. And there's that part of you and I that yearns to be glorified with Christ in eternity. I think of David in the Psalms, Psalm 84, verse 2. My soul longs and even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh cry out, for you, the living God. In the midst of tragedy, we have to remember that our souls long to be fully united forever with Christ. We're united now and we come into its fulfillment in the hereafter. We see now through a grass dimly, but later we're going to see face to face So for you and I, we need to take the long view. Those who we've lost in tragedy are home. Jesus told his disciples, I go to prepare a place for you and I'll come back and I'll bring you home. Comfort one another with these words. So brothers and sisters, we need to trust. We need to repent. We need to accept. We need to grieve. We need to embrace. We need to defeat. And we need to yearn. And we do it together. We cry together. We weep with those who weep. We rejoice with those who rejoice. We struggle through it. We fight through it together. We exhort and encourage one another. We It's messy. People are messy. Life is messy, but Jesus is real. As long as God has us here, He's got a work to do in our lives. Let's let Him do that, amen? Let's bow our heads and our hearts and pray. Father, You know all the tragedies, the ones that we've experienced over the last number of weeks. Lord, You know what's going to happen tomorrow. And Father, I ask that you would do in us what only you can do, that you would reveal to us, each one of us, what you're doing. Father, we we don't want to try and do it on our own. We don't want to try and separate our hearts, Lord. We don't want to fall into darkness or despair or apathy. But God, we want to be fruitful in the midst of a world that has a lot of bewildering things that go on. So, Father, we give you our hearts afresh right now. We ask that you would do something extraordinary in us. Have your way in and through our lives. And we ask it all in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, 
Amen.